Welcome to the Officer Autumn Show podcast, the realest and most upfront podcast designed specifically for female first responders. I'm your host, Autumn Clifford, and I hope you enjoy this podcast. Betsy, I'm so excited to have you on the Officer Autumn Show. Can you please tell our listeners a little bit about you? So, wow. So I'm a Midwest uh, born and raised farm girl. And uh, at uh, at age 21, two weeks out of college, I found myself in the Cook County, Illinois Police Academy. Um, I decided in junior high I wanted to be a cop. And uh, so I was a police dispatcher in high school, went to college, dispatched there, got out of college, became a cop in 1980. Wow. When um, women in police work, especially in the Midwest, um, were not a not a thing, um, and uh, so I had a terrific twenty nine year career with the Naperville Police Department, uh, Chicago suburb, and uh, and then uh, and then we'll go from there because I did have a parallel career, but I'll tell you the one of the biggest joys of my life was serving a community like naperville and uh um you know i I miss it i retired in uh uh, 2009 but uh but i'll tell you i would encourage anyone out there to uh to take a look at this profession because it's i never had the same day twice and i think every cop says that and it's one of the best things about this job absolutely so what do you do now betsy i know you're very Yeah. So now, so I'm a police trainer and an author, a consultant. Um, I have been training nationally since the early nineties. And, uh, uh, so now, um, my husband who drum roll plays is, uh, Dave Smith, JD Buck Savage. So yes, for those of you who remember the Buck Savage videos, uh, in the Academy or in training, I am indeed mrs buck savage that is so funny <laughs> <laughs> so i get to travel the country actually travel the world with buck savage and uh and we do uh, leadership training officer survival training and uh, i also have a class that i do called um the winning mind for women in law enforcement and uh which is just extraordinary we, we can talk a little bit more about that but i'm also the spokesman for the national police association i've been doing that for almost two years and the national police association you can see who we are and what we do at nationalpolice.org don't google us or you'll get some hate because there are um oh, yes. factions of the media that really hate us because we go out we tell the truth we help officers who um uh, frankly, aren't being treated well by their agencies. We help uh, community members and community groups. And uh, it's just a really terrific organization. So I'm their national spokesman. So I got, and I, you can see me a lot on Newsmax and uh, uh, some on Fox News and the BBC and yeah. One American News and, and uh, we, you know, on and on and on. And I'm uh, just about any newspaper article lately. Um, about any law enforcement issue, especially legal ones. Um, you'll see my name in there. And uh, it's really been an honor um, to be able to do that since, you know, to, uh, 2020, when uh, the law enforcement profession um, was just lied about and vilified. And, oh. uh, and so I'm trying to do what I can to, uh, to help tell the truth about this profession and about our people about us and about what we really do for our communities for our country you know here's the thing people who don't feel safe aren't free and i think right now in america uh, a lot of people don't feel very safe Mm -hmm. and the the people that are in between the criminal element and uh, the most of the good people of the united states is american law enforcement and Mm -hmm. yet there's less and less of us um Mm -hmm we're sacrificing more than ever uh, more than um you know since the 70s and 80s and uh and you know we need to be proud of that and speak up more about that yeah i mean look so i have a lot of questions i want to go back and then i want to come back to this the question i want to ask you is what does the national you said it's a national police association right national police association so can you tell me like what does that what is that what do you guys do 
So we are not a union. We are not an association that police officers join. What we are is a, a law enforcement advocacy group. Mm. So we advocate for law enforcement. We also advocate for pro-police citizens. And um, we, we get involved in various cases um, is just one of the things we do. So, um, for example, there's a um, female officer out in Los Angeles. Some of you may have heard of her uh, story where she's a competitive shooter, very beautiful young woman, gets involved in a shooting of a, uh, um, a, an EDP with a knife. And um, she, uh, she ends up having to shoot this man and and just responding to a crash that's all it was and uh so she um is being vilified and disciplined and all this not because she had to shoot this guy but because the last round she put into him um they decided that was excessive and the reason that they are they the community and they partially her agency are saying that it's excessive is because she's too good of a shot because Stop. she's a competitive shooter. So things like that, outrageous cases like that, we get involved in uh, by filing amicus briefs. Um, we got involved in several recent Supreme Court cases about um, police officer use of force, um, uh, um, qualified immunity uh, case. There's one we were involved in. And then we got, we're right now, we're involved in a case where a homeowners association in Indiana is uh, trying to make a pro police citizen take down a thin blue line flag saying that's racist so we decide you know what we're gonna get involved in that too so um you know that's one of the things we do the other things some of the other things we do is we help community groups start a citizen police academy or raise help raise funding for a vest for their canine or we'll um provide funding for a uh, community policing effort involving youth just all kinds of different things you mm -hmm. can think of we also have a show on uh pluto on cable and uh the first tv on streaming called the npa report and mm -hmm. um so that airs sunday mornings 10 a.m eastern and uh That's so we, cool. have diff we have all kinds of different guests on there i mean just everything from politicians to police leaders um we had sergeant john mattingly on from the brianna taylor case we had brandon tatum on um political commentator um you know all kinds of just really interesting people um to again who are pro-police and we talk about law enforcement issues and then of course we um we have a, a website twitter facebook you know nationalpolice.org you can find us on twitter and facebook um where we have a whole team of authors who publish just incredible articles and yes dave smith is one of those writers i do a little writing for them as well yeah and uh um we get the information out there and then of course they send me out to argue with antifa to get uh, you know on the air to get involved in um telling the truth yeah about the law enforcement profession so you'll yeah. again you'll see me a lot on Newsmax, you'll see me on Fox and Friends when it's 3.30 in the morning, my time here in Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, it's just a really excellent opportunity for people to see what law enforcement's all about through a very positive yeah. lens. And I think that's really lacking today. Mm. Yeah, so It's so true. And so <clears throat> I'd like to take you back. You know, even when I started, um, which is not that long ago compared to you. <laughs> so I started. Um, I'm super old. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've you've yeah. done a career. Let's just say that, you know, but even like when I started, so I, I started in 2010. Policing was just so different than what it is currently in 2022, oh, yeah. you know. And so but let's go back to the 80s. What was it like for you? Well, so when I. um when I got hired and the testing process back then was like six months of all kinds of stuff. I was actually one of the first groups in the Chicago suburbs um, where there was no height weight requirement. It was just, we were, I was the first group where it was height proportion to weight. So imagine now I'm five, five and uh, you know, I was 21 years old. I, I was in the best shape of my life. I, you know, I've always been an athlete. And um, so when I got to the, uh, uh, when I got hired and they brought us in for orientation, there was only four of us at that time. And um, 
the first thing my first sergeant said to me was, you know, I don't believe in broads and police work. Oh, nice. And, uh, you know, back then you didn't say anything. You shut up. And, you know, and I thought, well, that's interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, so so in the, you know, late 70s, early 80s, we uh, we had to really prove ourselves you know, above and beyond what was expected. And um, so we went through orientation. I went to the academy. Um, and again, this was the Cook County, which is Chicago, Cook County Sheriff's Police Academy, big, re huge regional academy. And uh, there were four women that started on day one. By Friday, I was the only one left. Wow. And um, so there was, you know, lots of hazing, lots of just overt um, sex discrimination. I mean, um, you know, I got early on in my career, because I had, there were a team of managers and supervisors at my agency who said, we got to get rid of this. We got to get rid of this chick. Mm -hmm. uh, not because I was incompetent, because I was too competent. Mm -hmm. And, and um, you know, I wasn't going along with the program of it just being, you know, um, <clears throat> whatever it is they thought I should be. And, uh, and so I got, I got written up, I got disciplined for things like disobeying a direct hint, standing with my feet too far apart for a woman um things like that using too much profanity in one context not with citizens involved too much profanity for a woman i, I still have all these memos such bullshit. <laughs> in a file because nobody believes me so there was a lot of there was a lot of hazing a lot of discrimination um but there was also a lot of support yeah. um from uh, for example, a guy who was my lieutenant, whose um, daughter um, is now she's a good friend of mine and, and a retired police officer as well. But, uh, you know, he was one of the uh, first managers at my agency that stood up and said, stop doing this. You know, let's let this mm -hmm. police officer be a police officer. And mm -hmm. he was just a fantastic mentor. My chief eventually stepped up and put a stop to all this nonsense. And, uh, and actually, the guy who said, I don't believe in broads and police work actually became a really good friend. So, you know, I, I guess I could have, you know, maybe retained an attorney that what kind of wasn't a thing back then um, or, you know, done all kinds of things. But instead, I kind of put my head down, went forward and mm -hmm. um, and frankly, um, ha again, had a really terrific career, became a leader in the organization. And, uh, um, you know, it wasn't. There, there's always going to be stuff. Yes. In, uh, and that's one of the things I teach now is, yeah. you know, I mean, let's face it in street police work. It's, a, it's, it's, you know, male dominated situation. We're still about 10%, about 30% of corrections, about 18% of federal law enforcement. Um, but when you look at a police organization as a whole, it's mm -hmm. about 50, 50 male, female. It's just that females tend to gravitate toward um, dispatch records, administration, um, but don't you think that might be, see, yeah, I mean, in dispatch, I mean, obviously it's a lot more women. I don't know. I can just speak for Maine though. We don't have a lot of women, you know what I mean? Like the smaller yeah. areas, it, it just seems to be, I don't know. Like it's, it's so funny because I talk to women and like, we have like agencies, like I'm going to give you an example down in like Broward County, Florida, they're fucking killing it. Like they have an LGBTQ, like whole community for like the cops, like super supportive. They love their females. Like it's awesome. And then, cause like some people will get pissed at me and be like, Autumn, oh, like, you know, you act like fucking police work hates women. I'm like, no, I don't. Like, I realize it's really good. And some agencies like you're talking about, like mm -hmm. there's some, it's great, but I, my DMS are filled with women who are like, yeah, well, it's not good for me. Like, my right, right. Oh yeah. I mean, I hear it all you know? the time. Uh, yeah. you know, I mean, I travel around the country and, and right. you women. must hear it. You must. Yeah. Hear oh, <laughs> absolutely. And it is, it's somewhat regional. Yeah. Um, you know, again, you know, you go to, you know, San Francisco or, um, Chicago, you go to, you know, you can name all the, all the big urban areas. Yeah. Um, but here's what we've got to look at, 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 uh, women in police work and why don't we have more, you know, why don't we have, cause there's like, there's that initiative. If you're familiar with 30 by 30, you know, we yeah, yeah, want to yeah. have 30% more. Well, here's the thing. What is it that we need to do to attract more women 
to this profession. And I've had this discussion over the last 25 years with everyone from media to police leaders, the ICP, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, and here's what I always get from, for example, civilian media. I did interviews with all, all these different women's magazines, women's health and blah, blah, blah. Why can't we attract, what do we need to do to attract more women to law enforcement? All of these civilians say, well, you need to make it more family friendly. You know, women can't have, you know, these bad hours and women can't work weekends. And stuff. Really? So we're going to tell men, hey, you know, y'all got to work midnights, weekends and stuff. Right. So the women can take care of the kids and all that. That's extraordinarily sexist, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things we have to realize in this profession is not all women are attracted to this profession. 100%. And that is the bottom line. Not all men are attracted to it, but a lot more men are attracted to law enforcement than are women. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do to make it more attractive? I don't think it's the profession. I think it's it's women. What do we got to do in the um, early education, junior high, high school, to make this profession more attractive? to you know not just women but to good quality candidates and now we're living in in the real world at a time where in grade school junior high and high school kids in america are being taught police are racist police are killers police mow down black people every day in this country and those are the things that are negatively impacting this profession well what do you think about this because I agree with what you're saying. One of the things that has come up a lot across the board for a lot of women in law enforcement is the maternity leave policy. Yes. I mean, that that alone. I mean, my DMs are filled with women like, yeah, I want to be a cop, but fuck me. Like they want me back. Like I was talking to these uh, female cops from New Jersey and they were telling me like they were back on the fucking streets after six weeks they were still goddamn bleeding like they were literally still bleeding they were having to wear like the fucking big thick pads and shit while they were back on patrol like after giving birth like i i mean when i opened that up on my socials like it, it's insanity to me that we don't have like oh okay like what can we do for like a better policy for that you know what i mean which to me well Right. For, and this is something I, I probably speak to the, um, the media about or a, or, or a leader, uh, somebody in a leadership position, at least once a week. I've done a lot of writing yeah. about this. Sure. I would encourage anybody to go to, you could just Google, what do you do with a pregnant cop and my okay. name? And you'll get, you know, I've written for officer on this, please, uh, please one. Um, Here's a couple of, uh, and again, and I have been talking to people about this for 25 years. So here's the thing. Now I, uh, personally, you know, was pregnant on the job. I hid it, um, up until my sixth month because I was going through the lieutenant's promotional process. Didn't want my eight, you know, now this is in the nineties, didn't want my agency to know about it at the time. And I was able to do that because I was really small. And, um, but right now we have no consistent policy. Um, in a lot of agencies, because one, because there's a, several things. There's a maternity policy, and then there's a pregnancy policy. Those mm -hmm. are two mm -hmm. different policies, yes. and yep. nobody seems to realize this. Now, That's again, right. larger agencies, you know, do a pretty good job of of you know when you come off the street. Our agency, you know, we had to go through lawsuits in my agency, and then you know finally we got some decent policy. But here's the thing. We also have to take some responsibility uh, for this as the individual women. I talk to women all the time who call me and say, well, I went in and told them I'm pregnant and now they're telling me to do this, tell me to do that. Okay, did you look at the policy before you announced your pregnancy or before you even thought about it? And I get it, sometimes we become pregnant accidentally. But before you tell, run in and tell your sergeant you're pregnant, go look at your policy. If you don't have a policy, ask about the policy, you know, understand, know what the law is in your state, know what the policy is in your, you know, whether it's county, state, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, and again, know what federal law says for a, a, uh, 
and and but i'll tell you is this is this why women don't come to the profession i don't i don't believe that at all i do think it's why women leave the profession mm -hmm. and i've talked to a lot of women who were just forced out they come and say you know oh i'm i'm eight weeks pregnant um and they're basically told go home and come back when you're not pregnant anymore mm -hmm. um but but we have got to take responsibility as women to find out what the policy is and if there's no policy write a policy you know, you don't need to be a chief or a, you don't have to have stars bars stripes scrambled eggs on your hat or any of that crap to get involved in writing a policy and um and take a take a look at uh, and if anybody wants to email me, sgtbetsysmith at gmail.com, I'll send you a couple of policies um, because we need pregnancy policy, then we need a maternity policy, then we need a nursing policy. Because, well, you, know, you know, Betsy, actually, what would be really good is I have some policies to put, like, I'd love those to put in like a Google Doc if you'd be open to just absolutely create, like a resource for them that they can just click. Because I had a couple send me some like good ones. Mm -hmm. and i was like yeah let's just let's because i'm i'm a big advocate like you like fuck it write it or propose it or whatever you right know what I mean? we got to do things to make things better for us so and we also need we need organizations like kalia um to to take this on in a better way we need organizations like the iacp you yeah. know who have dipped their toe into this yeah a little bit and there's an iacp policy you can take a look at but they we need to be leadership needs to be more vocal about it and policies need to be more consistent however i'm going to caution everybody because i get a lot of women who say well we just need a federal policy be careful when you're asking about federal policies because if you're going to have a federal policy when it comes to pregnancy and maternity then we're going to end up with federal policies when it comes to use of force and when it comes to hiring and firing and you don't you know you you need to think long and hard about opening up that can of worms really good point so what do you what do you see as like some of like the number one like what do you teach on all of the time for women like the women that are listening to this it, it's so funny we all think that we're so different and we have like all these different fucking problems or like we all run into the different things but um i'm sure just like you i see like the same trends over and over i'm just curious to hear like would you be willing to like what could we provide the girls listening right now like what do you what do you like run up against in your trainings like what are, like anything like that yeah oh for sure um you know first and foremost what we teach is uh personal responsibility mm. before you start saying you know oh if only he would do this and she would do that and they would do that and if the damn men why aren't they doing this first of all look in the mirror what can i do better mm before you start bitching about everybody else. Yep. And then we need to switch our mindset to from being a female is some sort of weakness yes. to looking at being a female in this profession is an amazing strength. And then, and when I, you know, and you can say that, oh, rah, rah, cheerleader, I am better than anybody, but I'm talking about learn the science behind the differences between men and women, the differences in the way we communicate, the differences in the way that we are structurally, um, you know, uh, physiologically. We are different in the ways that we handle firearms. We are different in the way that, that we, um, uh, you know, in the way that our body is structured and all of that. And, and so we need to, as women, we need to learn all of that so that we can take advantage of it you know the the women are you know there's so much talk now about um uh de-escalation and blah 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 women do that naturally oh yes we, we are you know every single woman cop listening right now i have no doubt can tell me a story of how they got somebody into a set of handcuffs and into the back of their patrol car without hardly ever having to touch them that's it. You know, because we're good at talking people into doing things they don't want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't take advantage of that. And our training doesn't train to it. So mm -hmm. again, Amber, you and I'll bet a lot of other women have been to defensive tactics classes where you're like, really? Really? You think this is going to work for me? And uh, because the instructor is doing a cookie cutter um, type of instruction and they don't understand how our bodies are different. Um, you know, a lot of women were, you know, go, you know, we talk about, oh, ground fighting, it's dangerous to go to the ground. Hell, for a lot of women, ground fighting 
is is a, an incredible advantage, you know, because we have that waist down um, power. Learn about your own power uh, physiologically and, of course, mentally, and then do whatever you can. Don't sit there and wait for the department to send you to a training class. That's you know, it. if you think there is something you need to learn, yeah. um, go learn it. Put put the damn, you know, coach purse back on the shelf and go pay for a training class. Um, you know, I was not a good shooter at all. And why? Because I had a Smith the Wesson Model 59 handgun that was, you know, my hands are so tiny and uh, and I couldn't shoot it well. You know, so you know what I did? You know, I went to various training classes paid for with my own money yep. and then just begged them, pestered them until uh, I could get a smaller handgun. And, yep. you know, you know what it did? It took 10 years. But uh, but I finally did it. And so in those 10 years, when I wasn't very proficient with my handgun, I got damn good with my shotgun because that's the only and I wore an ankle gun, you know, with a firearm that fit my hand. Um, those are some of the things you got to do. I feel like one of the one of the um, we talk about this in class a lot. Don't whine win. That's what we why we call it the winning mind for women, because mm -hmm. we do too much bitching about them. They need to do this. They need to do that. Do it yourself. If, mm -hmm. if, you know, and, and you know what, people will notice that. Mm -hmm. And, and one last thing I got to say to women, cause this is something I've said to a lot of women I've talked to, there are, comes a time uh, when you're young that you got to look at your agency and say, do I want to spend 20 years here? Do I want to <laughs> spend 30 years here? That's it. There is, um, there are a lot of times when we have got to look around and say, you know what, I don't think this is going to change. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, the, and that's a hard move to make, especially if you're supporting a family, you've got kids, mm -hmm. you're comfortable where you're at. Um, but don't be afraid to, to make that, make that move if you can do it. You know, you, you bring up a lot, you bring up a lot of good points and shit that I say, I say it differently than you, which is, so <clears throat> I have, so I've been coaching for the last eight years. I got injured in the line of duty, Betsy. I don't have a cool story. I just have a back injury. It took me out of full-time policing. Okay. And, um, from there I was couch ridden. I got really fucking depressed. And I said, you know what? Fuck it. Like, I'm going to just start coaching. It was back in 2015 and nobody really knew what coaching was. Okay. But I just said, you know what? I got training education experience. I'm going to go out and try to help some people start my podcast. And, and, and one thing leads to another. And I've been coaching first responders for the last eight years. The last year specifically, I've been focusing on women because I realized, fuck, there's just not a lot of female cops helping other female cops. I see a lot of beautiful female influencers. Okay. But I, when I go look at their shit, it's not like, it's not training and education. Okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Don't think I'm shitting on anybody. I'm just saying, I just saw a need. So I step into it. But what you're making me realize here is like, I'm saying the same thing you're saying. But the way that you say it is very different than me. I've caught a lot of fuck. I piss a lot of fucking people off because I just say, I mean, I'm just saying it the way that I see it, but the way that they're perceiving it is that I'm making up all these excuses. Well, I'm not. I'm I tell my girls, you need to take radical responsibility. Like go like I have a whole program coming out about teaching women how to shoot. Uh, I have an expert. He's a he's a fucking like he's a USPA P, uh, USPSA uh, competitive shooter. He's master level. He's a cop. He's fucking phenomenal. He's going to teach him how to shoot. I've got a pro MMA fighter who's a cop who's going to teach him DTAC. Like you said, on the ground, she's she walks around at a buck 30. She has to know how to fight. Right. Like mm -hmm. just different shit like that. Like I. but the thing what I like about what you I like how you put it. And I think it's important that, you know, everybody listening, be very fucking clear about it with me, but also be very clear about it within yourself. Like we have to not wait for our agencies to help us out. And we have to not be a victim to the job. You, you know, the job, the, jo the job, it's a hard profession. I believe, I believe in ways it can be harder for women, hands down, but we can't become victim to it. And I think there's a fine line there. And I just wanted to highlight that because you, you said it very well, Betsy. You demonstrated it very well. And um, I think it's important. Well, and Amber, what you're talking about is something that my husband calls the power of positive annoyance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you you can, um, you know, because here's the thing. When you go to your agency, your supervisor, whatever, and you say, oh, I think we should do this new thing. What What's the what's the number one 
thing that you hear from your boss, from the agency, whatever, you know, it no, because it's so much easier to say no than it is to say yes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we have to realize that. And when you go to your, like we were talking about pregnancy policy, when you go to your, you know, your boss, you go, you know, we have no pregnancy policy. They're going to go, mm, okay. You know, but when you present them with a fully written accredited pregnancy policy, and then you go from there and you, and you, you know, and then you couch it in such a way that, Hey, you know, instead of saying, you know what, we don't have a pregnancy policy and we're going to get in trouble and I want to get pregnant and blah, 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 blah. You say, Oh, you know what, uh, Sarge, I was looking at some of the policies and I think that this could really look bad for the agency if we don't have something in place and I'm willing to do whatever it is, write the policy, get a committee together, blah, 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 blah because I care about the agency and the other women in this agency. And, uh, and I want everybody to know what a great agency this is, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and that sounds a little over the top, but the no, power of way. positive annoyance. Mm -hmm. And because that's a lot of times as women in this profession, and I've done it myself, we go in and we get in people's faces and we're like, you know, you need to F and do this and this and blah, 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 blah. blah. And, uh, and after a while, they just, you know, they just shut down. And, and yeah. especially because I go back to the science of the differences between men and women and the way that we communicate and the way that we hear each other, we mm -hmm. got to quit. We got to quit a turning ourselves into men and thinking we have to talk like men and act Powerful. like men. And Powerful. B, we have got to quit assuming that men are going to accept what we have to say Mm -hmm. in the same way that they would from a man there are scientific differences that we can't get away from and yes now i'm in the yes you know the gender differences you know and and that's the problem is we're now in an atmosphere um and unfortunately it's become political that we're all alike we're all the same and we're not men and women are not the same right and we've got to you know i don't care about your uh sexual identity and i don't give a damn who you have sex with but we have got to recognize that men and women are different. We do things differently. And there, there are so many fantastic books out there. And, uh, um, you know, this is, we teach classes on this, you know, we, the truth about gender differences until the Biden administration and COVID, I was going into the Pentagon and teaching this stuff. I teach it all over the world. Um, and, uh, and it, it's incredibly helpful for people to learn how, we do things differently and it's okay to be different as long as we're treated equally uh, uh, in the eyes of the law. And we are supposed to be treated equally and we should be. I love that. Betsy, what do you want to leave the girls with? I mean, I, I gotta be honest, this whole last 10 minutes have been like really good, like knowledge bombs, <laughs> you know, but what, what, what would you want to say to the girls that are listening right now? Well, again, I would say be first and foremost, um, be self-reflective look in the mirror um but then i want every one of you to think about the day that you started on this job mm -hmm. what what were your hopes and what were your intentions and what was your mission mm -hmm. and that is i think the the number one thing that every individual police officer needs to look at is um that sense of mission what am I doing here? Am I just here to earn a paycheck? Mm. If that's your mission now, then you need to reflect on where you're at in my in your career and what you can do because nobody gets into this job to get rich. Uh, no. um, you know, and we're all working to pay our mortgages and, and all of that. But I want you to go back and I want you, if you've become cynical or frustrated, I want you to recapture that sense of mission of what it is you're trying to do. And then I want you to recapture uh, what we call that that sense of optimism, not, oh, my glass is half full. Oh, the world is wonderful. You know, all that bullshit. That's not what I'm talking about. I, I, a true optimist, someone who is optimistic, believes that they deserve a positive future. And mm -hmm. that's what you've got to think about. A true optimist can look at a crappy situation and say this sucks however i'm not going to lay down and die and i'm not going to wait for somebody to come rescue me i'm going to rescue myself mm -hmm. 
And then I'm going to move forward. Dr. Al Sieber calls it post-traumatic growth because mm. we all make mistakes and women especially beat ourselves up when we make mistakes and we look so women love to look back and say, oh, I can't believe I said that. I should have said that. I should have done that. Stop doing that. Mm. Look at what you did wrong. Learn from it. That's post-traumatic growth. And then move forward. Stop being so damn hard on yourself um, and appreciate yourself for wearing a gun and a badge every day and doing everything you can to help your community. And lastly, don't fall into that trap of blaming the men for all of your shortcomings. I, I have gone to have taught at every major police women's conference in this country 10 times over. And very often I go and I hear women, often high level women, who are saying, well, if it wasn't for the men, we'd do this. And if it wasn't for the men, we could do this. Stop the man bashing. Agreed. This is a family. It's a brotherhood. There are brothers. Sometimes they piss us off badly. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, there's a reason why we call it the thin blue line, the brotherhood of law enforcement, a family. We are a big, huge, dysfunctional family in mm -hmm. law enforcement, mm -hmm. but we are a family. We got to love each other and care about each other. And women, and you're doing this, Amber, women need to support and mentor each other. A hundred percent. I love what you said. And, and I just want to say this too, like, cause we, as we, as we wind down, it, it is, it is easy for us to go all the men, the men hate us, but I'm going to just tell you this. The men don't, do not hate us. The men, we are not in, in, we're not in like categorizing. There are men that do not like us. There are Absolutely. women who do not like us. You know what I'm saying? And, yep. and I'm going to just say this. I have women, myself included, have just as many issues with female supervisors as we do with male supervisors. So just so we're clear, like, because a lot of times I'll say they, and everybody thinks I'm talking about a man. And I'm like, no, I'm just talking about any of your haters. Anybody who tells you you can't. That could be that fucking female sergeant who is in a bad way herself. Like, it's not necessarily the men. And so I, I love that you said that. We, we cannot man bash. And um, the radical responsibility. Um, Betsy, where can everybody find you? Where are you? So you can go to our website, which is femaleforces.com. Um, you can find me on Twitter at SGT Betsy Smith on Twitter. You can go to nationalpolice.org and I have a, you can learn all about the National Police Association. You can access our YouTube page, see all of my interviews, all of my shows. And, uh, and uh, you know, I encourage uh, everybody to follow me on Twitter. I'm a little spicier on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but one of the things that we do on Twitter is uh, we really talk about the issues facing law enforcement today mm -hmm. and this terrible uh, vilification of law enforcement. I also have tons of articles on policeone.com, officer.com, law officer, um, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. I know the girls do too. You were definitely somebody that everybody was like, you got to get her on. So I'm excited to have you on. And um, thank you so much for being here, Betsy. Thank you, Amber. So I found a soap company that's Leo owned and they make women soap and men soap. And here's why this is important. There's a lot of excellent um, homemade and handmade um, and all natural soap, but they, they don't make men and women's soap. And so I found this company, it's called Patriots and Company. Highly suggest you look it up, uh, look it up and check them out. I have a whole box of their soap that they sent me. And I, my favorite one is called American Woman. It's pink, smells amazing. I've been washing with Beautiful Badass. That's really nice too. They have a whiskey girl, one that I really like. Anyways, go check it out. They also have scents for men. Um, but I wanted to just give them a quick shout out on here because I wanted to tell you about that because look, we're ladies. We need to know the companies that are doing things for us.